And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. The great book of Revelation, the taking off the cover, the revealing, that being the meaning of the word revelation, meaning you're supposed to know. You're supposed to understand. Now, inasmuch as we completed in the last lecture the fifth seal, well, what was that seal about? Because it came back into being. It was a witnessing, teaching seal. It meant that those things that Christ taught in Mark 13, which we covered and real good, they had shown many of them that had already were at the altar of God, not out here in some hole in the ground, but with God at the fifth seal. Christ doesn't return until the seventh trump and the seventh seal. You got that? Therefore, uh, this is long before Christ would uh, gather back to us. They're already with God, to be absent from the body, present with God. And he said, just a short season while your fellow servants on earth, and that be you, okay, finish that that must be done, which is to say the testimony, the teaching. So you have to really pay attention in this book of Revelation. Remember, back in chapter 1, verse 10, John was taken to the Lord's day. If you don't go there, you're never going to understand the book of Revelation. Because as it reiterated in chapter 4, verse 1 again, I'm going to show you things that happen that are past, present, and yet future. To what? To the Lord's day. Okay, that's to letting you know what happens at the very end. So, here we have them. They are, uh, the fellow servants must complete what they have to do. We're going to come now to the, um, the uh, chapter 6, verse 12, and we're going to have the sixth seal. Now, there's one thing you want to know about the sixth seal, the sixth trump, and the sixth vial. That's 666. Six, six. Does that remind you of anything? It should. Because in the sixth seal, the sixth trump, and the sixth vial, Satan appears as Antichrist. That's his number, all six of them, okay? All about three of them, but in the sixth sounding, uh, pouring, and unveiling. So it, should, it wouldn't take a very smart person to get onto that, would it now, really? You know, to understand? So that's where we pick up at here now, is with the opening of the sixth seal. That's not the one Christ returns on. He comes at the seventh seal. But um, the false Messiah does come in the sixth. Let's go with it with a word of wisdom from our Father. Chapter 6, the great book of Revelation, verse 12. And it reads, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Now what, what are stars of heaven? They're angelic beings, supernatural beings. Even as a fig tree casteth her untimely. You mark that in your mind. Not on time, untimely, out of time, out of sequence. Figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Now do you know the parable of the fig tree? You familiar with it? That's how why Jesus would tell you you better know it. Not maybe, not perhaps, but that you should learn it. The parable of the fig trees whereby you could understand uh, this particular saying. And um, untimely figs are figs that fall out of season. It's the same as when we were reading in Mark 13, pray that your plight be not in the winter, out of season, untimely. God has the perfect time for everything and you're supposed to know the seasons. That's why he gives you the seasons thusly. Okay, let's go and then if we may to the back again to the 13th chapter of Mark. Do you think he's going to have something? To, Jesus taught all this before. It's just a matter of you picking it up. At, at this sixth vial and as soon as uh, this... Um, 
the greatest tribulation and worded affliction in the 19th verse of this 13th chapter, but it means tribulation of Mark. That's Satan's tribulation. When you're going to stand against him, when you're going to witness against him, that's what the time sequence is. All right? Let's pick it up, if we may, with verse 24 and, and observe what happens here. Listen carefully. Verse 24. But in those days, after the tribulation, or whose tribulation? Get it straight in your mind. There are two tribulations. There is the tribulation of Antichrist, and then there is the tribulation of Christ. There's just one problem. You don't have to worry about the tribulation of Christ because he's not mad at you. His trib falls only on those that he's not happy with, his wrath. But um, this tribulation of Antichrist, hey, what a time to live to be able to fight against him spiritually. And you can cut it. You got it. You're a child of God. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. What does that mean? Well, prophetically speaking from the Old Testament, it means the brightness of Christ at his second advent is so bright that the sun doesn't even show up. All right? Verse 25. And the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. It's going to be a lot of adjusting attitudes fixed up, okay? If you, you're either with God God's program or you're out of it. Okay. Verse 26. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory after the false Messiah, the true Messiah comes. What a day that's going to be. Verse 27. And then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds. The four winds means from, that's Earth's number, okay? We've got four seasons, four directions, northeast, southwest, um, four points on the compass, uh, so forth. From the uttermost part of the Earth to the uttermost part of heaven. You see, there's a lot of God's uh, children that serve him that are, are as well in heaven. Now, returning back to the great book of Revelation, and we come to the... Um, sixth chapter, and we'll pick it up there in the... I find the sixth chapter. My poor old Bible is just like turning hot cakes, these uh, pages. We'll, we'll pick it back up now with the 14th verse and we return. Okay? And the verse reads And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. There's going to be a shaking. The point I want you to see is there's no difference in what Christ taught. When he walked the earth, he did not leave us helpless. Do you remember in the closing of the last lecture when we completed the 23rd verse of that same 13th chapter of Mark? He said, hey, look, I have foretold you all things. Now, the question, of course, is have you read them? That's the question. Verse 15. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men of the earth that is and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains why, why were they doing that why why are they trying to hide themselves christ is returning well let me put it to you this way how would you feel if you had attended some little old Christian church all your life, I mean right up there on the front row, never missed a, a, a session, a lecture, or a teaching, and when the Antichrist comes saying he was going to rapture you away, you jumped in the sack with him. And I, and I mean, you truly love the Lord. But nobody taught you that the false Messiah was returning first and that he was so great. But you see, friend, that's no excuse. Because God wrote you a letter personally letting you know. It's called the Word of God. Now, 
the reason they're going to be hiding is because they are so ashamed. How would you feel if you expected to be a virgin bride to the Lord Jesus Christ? And here you stand used by Satan himself. You are so ashamed that there's only one thing you want, and that's to die, to disappear. That's why they feel that way. Here's the reason, verse 16. And said, these, these uh, misfits, and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. What shame that will be. I'm glad we serve a God of love. Verse 17. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? The answer is easy. You. You that know his voice. He is your shepherd, and you know your shepherd's voice, and you follow him. You know the sound of the true word. As we stipulated back in the two churches that Christ approved of, you're either in one of those two and not in the other five, or you're in a heap of trouble. He said in that uh, Revelation 3, 9, you can open doors and nobody's going to shut it on you. Because once you open the truth and see it, you're not going back as a dog would to his vomit to untruths. You're going to stick with the Word of God so that you don't suffer this disgrace, this shame on the day of God's wrath. You know, it isn't so much... I can see, I know people pretty well. It is not so much that uh, they are evil. It's that they've been betrayed and they feel so ashamed that they can't face the living God. They just want to disappear. And, and I don't blame them. I would too if I've got caught in the sack with Satan whenever I'm supposed to be a virgin bride for Christ. I'd be a little ashamed too, wouldn't you? See, it doesn't happen to you. Stay in his word. Stay informed. I hope everybody understands I'm speaking spiritually, of course. Don't be impregnated with his mark of the beast in your mind. Stay a virgin until the true Christ returns at the seventh seal, seventh trump, and uh, the seventh vial. Don't fall off the wagon on the 666. So there you got it. Now we've got a little insert here. Uh, the end is about to happen and God's going to let you know what must happen just before the end. Be wise enough to understand it. Chapter 7 and verse 1 and it reads, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. Now fix yourself geographically. You're not in heaven now. They're on the four points of the compass of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. This four winds always indicates the end, okay? That the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. In other words, they hold that end until God says it is time. And these four winds centering on one part, one spot bring about the end of being. You'll find it written in Ezekiel chapter 37 whereby Ezekiel was ordered to prophesy or teach these dry old bones, meaning the, the whole house of God's house that were spiritually dead. They didn't know the truth. And Ezekiel said, began to teach us what's happening. He said, well, I see a little life stirring out there in them. Meaning a, a few of them are beginning to accept the truth and see God's word. And the four winds were involved with that. You found the four winds again in Daniel chapter 7. And here again you find them in Revelation chapter 7. You're going to find out why God is holding off the end here. Verse 2. And I saw another angel ascending from the east to where? Earth, okay. Having the seal of the living God. Now, now absorb that. Having the seal of the living God. This is the opposite of the seal of Satan, which is the mark of the beast, okay. This is God's seal. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. Verse 3, saying, 
listen carefully, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, is any natural thing, till we, till what, till we what, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now, the reason being for this as you're going to learn in Revelation chapter 9, Satan, when he is cast out on the earth, can deceive anybody he wants to, or can, has the ability to, except Revelation 9, 4. We'll be getting there in a couple, three days. You cannot, this is a direct order from God to Satan, you cannot bother those who have the seal of God in their foreheads. Now, what's in your forehead? Not on it, in it. It's your brain. It's your thought process that you absorb truth from his word that open doors of truth that no man can shut. Because you see that truth and you understand it and you understand the simplicity in which Christ teaches. Therefore, this seal of God is a very important thing. Do you have it? Well, where? In, 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 inside your mind, inside your forehead. You have a brain there, always use it and use it whereby you are productive and a fruit producer of God's word in affecting people, helping people. People need help. What, what did it say back in that last chapter that the fellow servants just had a short time to do what on earth? To witness, to face the uh, controversy between God and Satan, to plant seeds, to help people, to help people to understand the truth. And quite frankly, here we could say to help people receive the seal of God. Now, the seal of God is a very important thing. We'll take the subject up again in the ninth chapter, verse 4 of this same great book, the book of Revelation. In other words, hold the end until we've taught the people that are supposed to know. The end is not going to come until everyone that is supposed to be forewarned is forewarned, period. That's it. Well, wonder what's holding things up. Verse 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all, I repeat, all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now, you know, it is really sad that some people think, does, does that mean that there's only 144,000 going to heaven? Absolutely not. You've already heard of many that are already in heaven. Back in this sixth chapter we just completed, they're already under the altar of God. How can anybody be foolish enough to teach that only 144 are going to make it when evidently there is many? And you're going to find in this same chapter, there is, are so many that have already made it that you can't even count them. And then you got some that'll say, well, you're going to have to work hard at it, boy. No, it's a pleasure working for God. You don't have to be obnoxious to people uh, to serve God and to teach truth. And whatever you do, don't waste your time peddling something besides truth. 144,000, you know, it's funny, uh, you know, that's of all tribes, not just a few. And these are priests, people that are supposed to teach. Not saved Christians. I want to make that very clear. Not, well, they're saved Christians because they follow Christ. But they're not only of the tribe of Judah. They're of all 12 tribes. They're, I will say something about that a little later on, but we'll, when we come to it. Okay, well, let's read through these tribes. We'll, we're just going to go right on through verse 5. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Aser, um, and this is Asher in the Hebrew, Aser in the Greek, okay, were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Naphtali were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manassas were sealed 12,000. Verse 7, of the tribe of Simeon, 
were sealed. 12,000 of the tribe of Levi were sealed. 12,000 of the tribe of Ishakar were sealed. 12,000, verse 8. Of the tribe of Zebulon were sealed. 12,000 and of the tribe of Joseph. Does that sound strange? Well, of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. Now, you will notice that um, Dan and Ephraim are left out of this. There's a reason for it. You with companion Bibles, you're very fortunate because you know it is idolatry. Maybe it's, maybe it's a pretty good, and, but I, I will rest assured that in the 48th chapter of Ezekiel, in the Millennium Temple, they're back. Meaning, in the Millennium period, we're going to take names and kick dragon. We're going to get things squared away. The main thing that is taught in the Millennium is not, uh, everyone will know the Word of God in a spiritual body. You won't have to ask them, have you read the Word of God? They will know it in their spiritual body. It's discipline that they must learn. Discipline meaning to be a disciple or a pupil or to f remain focused with your priorities in order to Almighty God. They'll be back in the 48th chapter of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel from chapter 40 to the end it's all millennium. There's more about the millennium and the future in the book of Ezekiel than there is even in this book of Revelation concerning the millennium, that thousand year period that is known as the Lord's Day. Okay? So, we got them all sealed. Does that mean there's only that many going to heaven? Don't, don't be ridiculous. Okay? This means that many must have the truth in their mind. Now, these same ones will pop up again in the 14th chapter, and we'll say more about it at that time. It'll be a lot easier to explain at that time. Verse 9. After this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number. Who in the world is this? A great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. This means the Gentiles from everywhere stood. What were they doing? Stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Right from the Feast of Tabernacles, Leviticus 23, 39, the little palm branches. What, what are they standing there for? I, haven't you heard? Tradition of man says they're supposed to be out here in a hole in the ground. They can't come out of that grave until the seventh trump when the shout goes forth and they all pop out of there like a bunch of uh, baked uh, donuts ready to go. I'm not being ridiculous purposely. It's just ridiculous for someone to teach that. They're already with the Father. They're not out here in some hole in the ground. And they are Christians because they were before the Lamb and uh, they were wearing white robes, which means it was woven, as we're going to learn in the 19th chapter, from their righteous acts. You got any of those? If you don't have any righteous acts, we're all going to get to see you naked as a baby jaybird. There's more ways for shame than one, friend. Verse 10. This is what they, I mean, you can't even count how many people have already been saved. Well, I thought there's only supposed to be 144,000 saved. Don't show your ignorance. Verse 10, and cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb, giving praise to both the Father and the Son. Verse 11, and all, I repeat, all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four uh, beasts, the four living creatures, the cherubims, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God. Now, how can you help loving him? when we see his plan of salvation where you can't even count the number of people that are here, okay? Hey, we haven't even opened the eighth seal yet. Verse 12, saying, Amen. 
Blessing, what does amen mean? I, I, I like to tell you, that's that. It doesn't mean what some people, amen, brother. It means that's that. Straightforward and boldly. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. That's that. Now, you notice this was given to the Lamb back in chapter 5, verse 12, with the word riches instilled as well. So there's seven things here. This is to our Father, the Godhead complete. Verse 13, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? They're supposed to be out here in a hole in the ground. Well, I mean, hey, that's the way a lot of people teach it, friend. I mean, you know, don't they know that we serve a God of the living, not the dead? Satan is the God of the dead. Not even Satan himself is dead yet. To be absent from this body is instantly to be present with God in the spiritual bodies. We're through with these flesh bodies. They're never coming out of the ground. That's the meaning of the word resurrected. Part and company with flesh. Who are all these people? Where did they come from? Verse 14, and I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, I sure don't know, you know. And he said to me, listen carefully, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That gives you the time sequence that it was in the blood of the Lamb, and it certainly could have been in part, I will say, for someone that might say, well, what about those that died before he came? Well, read 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. Jesus went while he was yet in the tomb and preached to those that had died all the way back to the time of Noah and gave them an opportunity to wash their robes. Do you notice something about that? You know, people are strange creatures. They either want something instant, easy, automatic, or just just ask, could it be given? D didn't you notice what it said? It did not say, or let me ask a question. I'll do as the little angel did. Did Jesus wash their robes in his blood? Ain't no way. No way, no how. They had to wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb. It took action and work on their part. Or they're just out of luck. You know, uh, many people, uh, they want such an instant, ever-ready religion. That's why so many people are going to be deceived. They're not studying the letter that Jesus has written, for he is the living word, that foretells you all things, whereby you're prepared, whereby you're ready, whereby you're an overcomer. And what is really strange about this to me is the only thing man basically fears I'll say it again. The only thing that man and flesh basically fears is the unknown. Once he knows, he's going to prepare himself for it. He, he'll go to, I mean, he'll go to any means to protect himself from that that he fears after he knows what it is. And then he'll feel pretty good about it. Why, in as much as God's word is what protects you from Satan, deception, from poverty, and many other things, would you not want to be informed? I don't get it. Why would you want to live in fear of that that's going to be when he's telling you right here exactly how it's going to be? Exactly how it's going down. Wash your robes. I could, you know, I could, I could preach several sermons on that statement. Inasmuch as the 19th chapter, verses 7 and 8, are going to tell you that the fine white linen that your robes are made out of 
is woven together from your righteous acts. Now this, this is going to upset some people, but be that as it may. Because salvation is, was intuitively bought, purchased, and paid. But let me just ask you a question. If your robes are your righteous acts, what have you got to wash? Hmm? If you don't have any linen here to wash in his blood, what are you going to wash? Well, I guess I wouldn't have a robe to wear. That's what I'm saying. You're naked. You've been warned about that three or four times in this book. You've got to take the action. You've got to wash the robe yourself. First, you've got to have it. How do you get it? Well, when we get to chapter 19, 7 and 8, if you haven't got it figured out by now, maybe you will by then. God's word is complete. There's nothing difficult about it. It's so ever rewarding to know and understand. Verse 15. Therefore are they before the throne of God. This is why they're there. They didn't make it to that throne any other way. Just stumbling around. They earned it. And serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Yahweh Shema. Or you could say Shekinah glory. Both in the Hebrew tongue. One Shema. He's there. He's dwelling there. He lives there. Shekinah. God hath dwelt. He's already there. Verse 16. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. Have you ever been in a place that was so hot you thought you was going to die? <clears throat> I, I guess I'm going to say it. A spiritual body could walk through fire and it wouldn't hurt it. Spiritual body could walk through that fire in um, that Nebuchadnezzar had heated seven times. And it wouldn't. It wouldn't hurt a spiritual body. It is in a different dimension. That the uh, many of the things that ply on flesh doesn't ply on that. Period. No effect. None effect. What a precious thing to be is to be in that light. Verse seventeen to complete the chapter. For the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There won't be anything that offends any longer. Nothing that offends. All tears wiped away. Everything made right. Do you know, to lead you, the lamb, that's the shepherd. That's the way a shepherd handles his sheep. Um, you know, sheep are a valuable product, uh, pro properties to a shepherd. I mean, that's, that's the way, this is an analogy. That's the way he makes his income. He doesn't go around with a club knocking sheep in the head, all right? Beating them to death. He takes good care of them. That's what he wants to do for you, is for you to learn his word. Behold, he has foretold you all things. Whereby, you know, before you can enter into a business, you gotta know a little something about it. Well, so it is with being a Christian. Before you can become a Christian, and be useful. I'm adding and be useful. I mean, you could be one of these naked baby jaybirds sitting over here with nothing if you wanted to just say, I believe, I believe, I believe. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. And that's all you ever get out of him. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, honey, that's beautiful. But go past that. that. That's a baby that's Christian that's not even potty trained yet. Messy. Somebody's got to take care of him. Okay. Get into his word and mature and be a mature Christian in the simplicity. You see how simple Christ makes it to understand the revelation? 
Don't miss any of the lectures. All right, bless your hearts. Listen a moment, won't you please?